broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. It's opening up the uh, WebEx right now. Okay, great. And I've got the meeting officially started. And so we'll get this going here. Um, just to kind of make sure John understands too, uh, Dr. Harrison is cardiologist at Memorial of Tampa. And uh, recently we did a presentation to look at CT. Um, so cardiograph, revolution CT, et cetera. Um, and uh, they'll be looking at something um, at, at some point this year. I'm not exactly sure when, um, but uh, they are looking at an additional CT. Okay, great. John, are you, you're on, you could just use this phone call, right? Yeah, hold on, I'm just switching my, my headphones. Okay, and we're going to put, uh, find the option where we can share the screen. So hang on here for a yeah. minute. We're going to find a share the screen option. So sharing. Hey, and John, while we're waiting, could you just kind of so introduce screen. yourself so that they know kind of who you are as well? That's possible. Okay. Um, I'm a principal engineer. I've been, uh, uh, this is kind of my background. Uh, my PhD work was doing MR. I did uh, 17 years of echo. And now for the last uh, eight years, I've been doing cardiac CT, uh, working extensively on the, the revolution CT system. And now I'm heavily involved with the cardiograph system. Uh, so, uh, kind of the, all the features associated with the system, especially with uh, with cardiac focus. So, uh, basically, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm a uh, a cardiologist who uh, has uh, done just about everything you can do in cardiology. I've done fourteen thousand heart casts and angioplasty from the beginning of angioplasty. And my uh, my transplant patient will be the oldest in the world uh, coming up pretty soon. He's been like 34 years now post-transplant. And uh, I uh, teach cardiac imaging, which is cardiac MRI, PET, and CT. And we have 4D echo and speckle tracking strain echo. Get the best uh, machine you could buy from GE in Norway. And then uh, we've uh, basically started in 2004 with the decision that we would no longer do cardiac cath or nuclear scanning in terms of spec scanning and uh, that we would start advanced cardiac imaging technology and get an outpatient center of which there are many that had PET, CT, and MRI, and basically put the money into that to upgrade all the equipment to be able to do cardiac as well as the radiology piece. And so we did that, and since that time, I guess we've done at least uh, maybe 6,000 CTs, and we have a 5,000-patient database, which we call Sherlock, which we use and we curate in order to make future decisions on patients' probability of having cardiac events based on the data of our past experience, many of whom have had repeat scans over the years. And then uh, I guess we've done 4,000 PETs and we've done a couple thousand MRIs. And we decided that we would follow these patients beginning in 2004 and uh, that all decisions would be made from non-invasive imaging, which we have done. And we send people to surgery without cardiac cath anymore because we've got all the stuff we need. And uh, we have, we consult with maybe uh, 20 different consultants around the country. And so I'll show you some, uh, a piece of our concierge stuff. So we do have a fourth year fellow we train. And so let's bring up, uh, there's so much data to tell you it's really hard to tell you how to get started and tell you what we're doing, but let me just pop something up that might get you oriented as to what we're doing. So I'll pop this piece up that we present to concierge doctors. 
And so uh, we call it concierge cardiology, but it's the same price as anything else. And we're interested in uh, the evolution of plaque in patients. And we're very interested in asymptomatic people and predicting cardiac events in them, which is sort of our forte in a way. And so we're very interested in uh, what is going to happen to somebody and whether they're going to have a rupture or a thrombosis. And we can basically pro uh, project that based on information that we have. And here's somebody who has a, a couple deep craters in their ulcer that uh, has activated plaque that's uh, certainly at risk of having a thrombosis. And uh, here's somebody who has a couple deep lipid lakes that's more at risk of uh, having rupture of, uh, of one of these plaques. And so, and then we basically do all kinds of imaging to show uh, myocardial perfusion in terms of iodine, show how much myocardium is being subtended, which would be called uh, a functional myocardial mass or FMM. And uh, we also look at the length of uh, the plaque and the length of the vessel and how much muscle is subtended. And uh, this is some perfusion studying. And we basically try to correlate that with uh, speckle tracking strain echo. And so we've got a lot of interplay between all the imaging techniques. And uh, here's a plaque that's going to rupture, and uh, which we predicted, and which actually ruptured in four days. We use heart flow, of course, and we've been very active with that. We're very interested in the blisters and uh, what that's going to what that's going to amount to. This is the FFR from Heart Flow that we use. We also have a couple of poor men's FFRs that we do based on our our technology and stuff. Here's the FFR on the guy who's going to rupture, who ruptured in four days, uh, and he had a convergent divergent double cone that is very subject to the Navier-Stokes equations, which we use sometimes. Usually the uh, concierge doctors are doing calcium scoring and haven't been into coronary CT angiograms. And so we present them the information of what calcium tells you and what the angiograms tell you. And, of course, we're interested in, you know, identifying uh, these calcium walls that we think are walling out the adipose tissue that's on the outside that's in communication by vasovasorum with the wall of the vessel and the adventitia. And um, this is some, something about coronary calcification, recent publication that was useful. And uh, this is uh, the core RADS uh, reporting procedure that we use. And uh, this is somebody that has uh, 50%. Hello? You had a question? Wait a minute. Can't hear you. Go ahead. Okay, that's the new reporting procedure that the coronary rads. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's like over the last year or so. Yeah, that we've been we we use that automatically. We started doing that. It's very useful. And so here's someone who has a a significant lesion in the mid LED, and mid LED lesions are are very nice because they uh, and this particular lesion having just fibrosis is just going to actually occlude, and we have a group of patients to show you, it occludes and it's got retrograde filling as well as antegrade filling, so there's no catastrophe. And so the mid-LED is a very friendly lesion. And so this is to show that it did occlude later on, and it's exactly what we suspected would happen. And uh, the FFR that we use all the time, this is our little schematic that we use in, uh, to look at a lifetime and to look at people in their decades and what their risk is based on inflammation, genes, lipid pool, arterial wall, microbiota, macrophages, and necrotic core, plaque ulcers, activated platelets, fibro fatty, statins can accelerate calcification. Uh, and then after you get calcification, it could lead to what I call ossification. Calcification is actually turning a fibro fatty lesion, becomes fibrotic into calcified. And then ossification is where you add more calcium with hydroxyapatite using that as a nidus to become uh, precipitate and become a acc accretion of calcification. And then malignant calcinosis uh, is where you have a calcific stenosis or plaque erosion or fracture. And so and those are not so common. And, uh, and then this is uh, looking at 
trying to convince people that we don't think calcium scoring is a good idea, that it's more important to find out more about what's happening with these lipid likes. And uh, this is our Sherlock personal plaque uh, analysis of low radiation CT, small database of patient outcomes to build a plaque analysis program coupled with uh, some of the biomarkers as Bayesian inferences for developing hypotheses as learning algorithms identify those at low, intermediate, high risk, and prevent uh, heart attacks. And we have plaque share where actually people send me uh, their CT scans that have been read by radiologists, and then we overread in terms of cardiology to give them more information. And uh, if you have somebody with a calcium score of 180, you could be any different prognosis depending upon you know what their calcium, what their lesions actually look like in terms of necrotic core, lipid lakes, convergent, divergent, double cones, and navier Stokes equation, activated platelets, fibro fatty, plaque erosion. And so, so we can actually tell people where they actually lie, and that's pretty important to be able to do that. And of course, if you're have it, and we look at transcompositional coronary calcification as opposed to ossification, which are two different processes. Uh, and uh, and we follow that out. And uh, calcium is really something that we think is a friendly thing because it's a biological cement and seems to wall off some of these vessels that were had a lot of lipid that were in trouble. Here you can see, here's a four-day, here's a 188-day, there's a 420-day plaque. We can show you 600-day plaques. And we look at them to see how can we predict when they're going to have a cardiac event. We think the calcium actually walls off the intercommunication with uh, the brown fat that's on the outside of the vessel that acts as a uh, heat genesis, thermogenesis uh, without shivering and uh, keeps uh, vessel blood warm in the event of a catastrophic event. So you've got that on your carotids, you've got that on your coronaries, also the renal arteries and the abdominal aorta. This is showing you different kinds of calcification and how the calcification is pretty important, especially if it's got a trailing edge, because trailing edge calcification is incomplete, and that means that there is at least some fibrosis in there, and there may be some lipid as well. So we think there's a lot to be learned just by looking at calcium instead of just scoring it. Uh, and uh, this is the patient that, uh, if you did a calcium score on him, it would be seven. But he has this big uh, dome-shaped necrotic core, and he's got a convergent divergent uh, half cone. And so this is a time bomb. And so we basically miss the whole thing if you're just going for coronary calcification, which a lot of the concierge doctors are doing. And here's an example of uh, someone who's going to rupture in 24 hours because we're going to do uh, his hip. And so we're going to expose his plaque ulcers uh, two uh, platelets that have been activated by bone powder from hip or knee surgery, which actually gets fibrin on both ends of it and then activates the platelet system. And so we're predicting this patient's going to have a heart attack within 24 hours of surgery. And uh, so we had a nurse navigator follow him around and he uh, went home and uh, she t he took her phone number and the daughter went home with him and then he started getting chest pain and they brought him back. And indeed, he had a heart attack exactly where we said the plaque uh, would fill up uh, with platelets. And so we were the first patient that you ever predict is going to have uh, within 24 hours a heart attack after having his hip done, who's asymptomatic, which was kind of cool. And so, and then it's pretty interesting, huh? And yeah. So, and so these are some of our other guys uh, that we've followed. Here's a 600-day. Here's a 420-day. Here's 188-day. And uh, here's a four-day. So it's kind of interesting. And then this is the, the patient, 68-year-old uh, gentleman, who basically we predicted was going to have a heart attack when he had his hip done. And, of course, uh, Medicare isn't prepared to put stents into people you know, who are asymptomatic uh, because the stents are basically for an acute MI or for somebody who has uh, pain that can't be controlled by medications unless you got like main left disease or something like that. And so this is where he was. Most of our Tampa people were over like this, benign coronary calcinosis. So he was very aberrant. And so uh, we knew he was going to be trouble. And so that's what it looked like. And the, the point is, again, the plaque ulcer uh, 
plus the activated platelets. And of course, you can't put a stent in. It's not going to work, and it's not going to be advocated, and it's not going to be paid for. And so, and here's a coronary stent just to show you a picture, and that's for changing lifestyle or for acute MI. And uh, here's uh, some of the recommendations that we make on people uh, that we're trying to alter the course of their plaque. And we can show you that with this kind of therapy, we are able to change a plaque uh, by 20%. So uh, that's a lot because usually in the literature, you see these studies where the plaque is gone from uh, some number to some other number, and there's a 0.08 change. And uh, we're showing 20% changes, which is much more meaningful. And uh, some of these people have been on PCSK9s. That's this one's on a PCSK9. And you can see uh, obvious changes. This is a group that we work with, uh, which is uh, uh, sort of specialists around the country that uh, help us in our decisions. So we're always looking for people that can uh, cause less invasive damage and uh, can uh, basically get our patient out of the hospital and in a much shorter time and uh, can offer us uh, some uh, real help. And so uh, these are some experts around the country that are very helpful to us on a daily basis. And we actually do webinars with them and present uh, our patient and the patient sitting there with us. And we're all on video camera and uh, that works out well. And then the patient goes and gets something done in one of these uh, centers. And uh, these are our contracted partners with uh, HCA, IBM Watson, HeartFlow, Vital Images, uh, McDill Air Force Base. Uh, and these are some of our education arms. Uh, and we do have the International Cardio-Oncology Society, which is based out of this office. Uh, and we're having our global meeting that we had in London last year, Vancouver the year before, is going to be in Tampa this year. So we're excited about that. We started a new International Cardiac Society, that's the International Cardio Orthopedics Academy, which uh, we've been able to show a reduction in cost in patients that are bundled for orthopedic surgery by restraining cardiac cost. And uh, we've got a reduction right now, we're showing of $2,500 average per mm -hmm. case based on the one out of seven that get a positive troponin event when they have hip or knee surgery if they're older age of uh, 65. And then we have people that uh, travel, and this is our, our longest uh, <laughs> traveling individual that came from Dalian, Dalian China, uh, 7,000 miles away. And the family's here and we're reviewing uh, the imaging uh, with this family. And uh, we have people come in from all around the country to be tested. And, uh, and also we have images sent in from around the country for us to review, sometimes on a daily basis, uh, for some groups, and so so that's uh, kind of what we're doing, and uh, that's what we sort of call concierge cardiology, uh, that uh, basically is not concierge prices, and so this particular test, the cardiac CT, we uh, did a workflow and work study of a technician uh, doing cardiac CT and found that uh, they start the IV, it took about five minutes, 10 minutes for the test, and then 45 minutes post-processing. And so we said, we'll just take out the post-processing. If you give us a $199 price and the hospital agreed to that, they said, just give us a, the disc or push the images over here and we'll analyze the data set ourselves. So we have like $600,000 of hardware and software here for analyzing uh, data which we do on a daily basis because that's what we really like to do. And so that's sort of an overview of, uh, of our position here. And then we can show you, like we get images coming in from Indianapolis, uh, from one of your scanners there, as a matter of fact, Jim knows about that. And so we will show you what we see and how different those are from our Tampa patients, because they are a lot different. And so with that in mind, uh, we'll show you what we call regional coronopathy, because coronary disease is different in different places. And so this is, again, the analysis of data of that one patient. All this information came together to tell us that when he had his hip done, he was going to have a cardiac event within 24 hours. 
And uh, so this is the new scoring system that we talked about. It's actually the CAD RADS. It's said core RADS here, but it's CAD RADS. And uh, this is our uh, analysis that we've used to put together all the data that we have on people and the risk of their plaque. And uh, basically, this is what we see in our Tampa patients a lot because they're all on statins and are all being well managed and they're on special diets and so forth. And uh, of course, we use the heart flow that you know about. And uh, then this is a group of patients that we analyzed. And we're real interested in the Indiana group because of the histoplasmosis granulomata that they have and the exposure to histo. Here's a lesion that we found in this one with some decreased blood flow on the anterior lateral wall. And uh, basically, this patient was uh, CAD reds 2 to 3 uh, with a vulnerable plaque in the first diagonal. And so that was interesting. We said this guy is in his 60s. And so we recommended doing these things to uh, develop a model for him for through treatment. And uh, here's another gentleman with an elevated hemidiaphragm on the right. And it turned out that that, again, is from histo. And he's got a gone complex from histo with all these mediastinal nodes that's calcified. That actually the cardiophrenic nerve runs through there. And that's how he got the paralysis of the uh, right hemidiaphragm was from histoplasmosis, which was kind of interesting. That's been reported in the literature a while back. And uh, then here's some decreased blood flow in the CTMPI, uh, which uh, basically has 58% rejection fraction. He's a CAD reds 3 with a vulnerable lesion. And so here's a guy in his 70s, you know, unlike the people in Tampa, a guy in his 70s who's very positive in terms of what's going on with him. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. And uh, here's this lesion. He's got this lesion in the PLA. That's a 65% mid-LED lesion, 24% uh, necrotic core at the stenosis, 52% necrotic core in the plaque, and a convergent, divergent double cone. And uh, here's somebody uh, with chronic pericarditis, and he's got pericardial calcium, which we think that's histoplasmosis as well, which is interesting. He's also got an aneurysmic uh, of his ascending aorta that's uh, 46.7 millimeters, calcified pericardium. He has a normal MPI. This is scattered ditzels. and doesn't mean anything. It's just noise. But he did have uh, some plaques that were interesting. And uh, they looked at the mild, uh, myocardium at risk. We also looked at the left atrium, and the left atrium had significant left atrial enlargement. And uh, if he had myocardial regurgitation, balancing out uh, his cardiac output from right ventricle and left ventricle and subtracting him, his myocardial regurgitation, mitral regurgitation would be 24% with reduced LA contractility because we did an ejection fraction of it. So we think he's going to have uh, atrial fibrillation. And he's at risk of that and suggested doing a recording of his heart rate. And we were truly, we were right. And he did have atrial fibrillation and developed that. And so just reading off his CT, we were able to come to that conclusion. And uh, he's over here. You know, a risk of acute current insufficiency is high. Risk of atrial fibrillation is high. Risk of acute current insufficiency is low because he didn't have much going on there. And so we made some recommendations. Here's somebody where they actually did the calcium score and they scored the mitral annulus as part of the coronary calcification, which is not a very good idea. And uh, here we found LED 59% diameter, convergent, divergent, double cone, 43% necrotic core at the stenosis, 31% necrotic core at the plaque, normal blood flow by CT MPI, and uh, no regional wall motion abnormalities. But he's over here too. So Indianapolis really has a lot of people that are wandering around. They've got some problems with them. Now here's our Tampa, here's our Indianapolis, and so we're really interested in what's going on and why that is, and we wonder if there's some uh, relationship for the coronary calcification with histoplasmosis, because it is, they are really in the histozone. Turns out the histozone, diabetes, the fungus, coronary artery disease, all of these overlap, which is very interesting, and uh, so we have older patients with heavy calcification, with vulnerable plaque, is very unusual, they're in the 84th percentile in terms of their coronary calcification. The expected was 50. So there may be some bias in terms of the selection of patients that were sent to me. But uh, we were then wondering about coronary calcification, histoplasmosis being a link, and maybe coronary calcification isn't really a valid in this group of patients. 
And so that's, uh, that's some of our ideas there. And so we've got, you know, tons and tons of data that we've collected over these years on these 5,000 patients. And we're doing like 10 patients a day. So we're having pretty high volume. And so it's really interesting. So we would really like to work with the, uh, the cardiograph uh, team because we think that would be very interesting and certainly to apply some of the things that we know. Here's some of the things that we frequently saw in engineers that are interested. Uh, this is our Smart Dog production. That's our own video media conduction, uh, production company. And uh, that's Beaumont, our therapy dog in the office that uh, Jim probably knows. And uh, there's about our mission. We'll skip that. And we'll skip this on plaque regression. You've seen all this stuff. And uh, and we've made three presentations to Watson and working on uh, several projects with them. Here's our hierarchy of big data we think is really important. And we're going to put this in place in the future. And then uh, we're a project cardiac advisor with IBM. We're interested in asymptomatic individuals. And uh, basically, if you got three vessel disease, whether you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, it doesn't matter. You're going to have the same mortality rate. And so we think the plaque is back as being something very important. And of course, uh, stress testing is obsolete and of no value. And the CTA is uh, of great value. And we look back at some of the old work that was done. Are you there? Yeah. Oh, good. Somebody's trying to call in. Don't worry about that. Of course, Navier Stokes is very important to us. And this morphology where uh, form follows function. And so we're very, very interested and involved in the physics and engineering. Upstream, downstream plaques are important. And uh, the morphology as well as the composition is important and so on and so forth. And so this is a recurrent uh, lesions and we're interested in people who have recurrence and uh, to break this cycle. And of course, uh, we're using uh, colchicine to break the cycle. And we've had some pretty good results with that. Uh, some people are using monoclonal antibodies uh, to break the cycle. And we're interested in durability, tensile strength, uh, biomechanical and biochemical function, as you all pretty or probably know about, and uh, dome-shaped necrotic core. What is it that actually happens to these? We've actually done some three-dimensional studies and printed out uh, three-dimensional plaques to try to have a better understanding of what's going on and so inflammatory markers are very very important and we've got several that we're using now and of course tamayo assay is very important to us with uh, dr stanley hazen who's been down here with us and uh comparing the stemmies and very non-stemmies and we also do a placogram here's a placogram where we're interested in one particular plaque. We don't give them all the radiation it takes to get a whole heart. So we just do one slice and we compare the plaque before and then after treatment without having to do a whole heart, which is, uh, there's another placogram, which is uh, kind of interesting. Here's a plaque that's changed and it shows what's happened over a period of treatment. And this one has actually become more stenotic, but it's less vulnerable. And so that's a good thing. We did predict this patient was going to have angina on the treadmill. And it turns out he was sitting right here with his doctor and, his, and he said, yes, I am. And his doctor didn't even know it. And we said, yeah, we can tell by the change of the lumen. And so we've just got uh, tons and tons. And here's a placogram on a patient. It was kind of interesting. On, we actually did this one because there was an artifact in the left anterior descending and we couldn't read it. And so we're not sure what caused the artifact. There was some motion. It didn't look like it was heart rate related. And so we said, let's just pull I'll, I'll do another shot and just get that piece. So the radiation will be one fifth of the amount of radiation because it would take five slices to make this heart. So let's just, we'll do one fifth the radiation, repeat that, and then we can fill in the piece. And so that's what we did. And so we do as much uh, creative stuff. Here's a plaque that actually the patient got developed this between this time and developed angina. And so by finding this, we treated him very aggressive medically and he didn't rupture, and so that was a good thing. But it does explain why he showed up in the ER with chest pain, uh, and uh, basically everything was normal, and they were going to send him home and say, oh, you're fine, but he's not fine. He's got this new uh, plaque there that's got a very solid lipid core that looks pretty dangerous. 
and uh, so on and so forth. You can just see a bunch of the comparison of stuff we've done and uh, just millions and millions of images on folks. And so that's just to give you an idea, an overview. Then we're interested in the microcalcification that act as night eye to produce calcification 10 years later, and you wonder where it came from. And there's just little, it's not because there was sealing over lipid core, it's because there was already a deposit of calcium in the wall that we couldn't see, and that calcium in the wall then multiplies, and there's an accretion of hydroxyapatite, and it gets bigger when they come back, but it doesn't mean they've had active plaque. And so here's somebody with tiny focal calcifications, the origin of the LAD and so forth, and uh, calcium begets calcium, and this is the way it looked uh, 10 years later. And so, but there's still, there's never been in this patient any lipid lesions that this is sealing over. This has just been ossification on top of ossification, which is uh, basically in a safety zone, and that's not a risky thing. And so this is the stuff we're interested in. <laughs> okay. Do you get some ideas? Oh, here's somebody, this guy, this, here's, here's an interesting guy. This guy 12 years ago had this and 12 years later still has this. And we call that one and done. Okay. So, uh, so anyway, I'd love to work with, uh, with somebody on this cardiograph and I'd love to get involved with your workstation that you're using. And I'd like to move this forward. So we have, uh, some new, information and we there's not a lot of people that are interested in this because most people are staying where they are uh, the commercial cardiology is very much involved in stress testing and uh, basically feel that that's a way to make money and they have a 40 percent false positive 65 percent false negative and so all those patients go to the cath lab that don't need to be there and have normal coronaries and all those patients that have coronary artery disease, uh, go home with a false sense of uh, assurance and reassurance. And so that uh, doesn't work out very well. And, uh, and that model is going to continue until we have opportunities to replace it. And so we look at where do we have opportunities. Opportunities are with concierge cardiology. Uh, the other opportunity is uh, we started our own subspecialty, uh, which is called cardioorthopedics. And we'll bring that up for you. Let's skip this one and let's go over here. Cardioorthopedics. So this is a prediction, not narrative. is the real test of our understanding of cardiology. And this is the evolution of cardioorthopedics, which is our own subspecialty that we've started here. And we would like to invite you to our cardioorthopedics first webinar which is coming up February the 1st at 9 o'clock. It's an international webinar that we're going to be hosting and present uh, cases every month, and it's going to be the first case conference of cardioorthopedics in the world, so it should be a lot of fun. And so uh, you can see that there's going to be uh, a lot of interest in what we do because these orthopedists uh, have bundled patients, and there's a set amount they get paid. And if they're outliers that take them over that, they lose money. If they stay under that, they make money. And so it turns out that the number one problem used to be DVT-PE in the American Society of Cardio uh, of Orthopedic Surgery basically has 183 pages of guidelines for preventing DVT-PE, and they have two pages for cardiology. Well, cardiology is the number one cause of serious complications today, so obviously they haven't caught up. And so if we look at our 5,000 patient database, we come up with patients that died, got stented, went in atrial fibrillation, got in trouble, all the things. And so we call them bundle busters as opposed to bundle boosters. And so we got atrial fibrillation, hypertension, LVH, and coronary artery disease as our bundle busters. And you look in the literature and you see sort of uh, the same correlation and one out of seven knee or hip will have a positive highly sensitive troponin T fifth generation Roche test on the Cobus uh, platform. And so if you have a silent MI, you have a, a increased mortality. And uh, this is where we're talking about uh, 
about your mother-in-law, Jim, and uh, you got you get on this line and you're in trouble. You know, even though nothing showed up during the first 90 days, that that positive trephonin event is going to come back to bite you. And so, uh, and so we're interested in preventive cardioorthopedics, silent heart attacks, atrial fib, hypertension, LVH. One out of seven patients are going to get a positive troponin over the age of 65. That's either MI1 or MI2, and could be atrial fibrillation, could be the hypertension. $20,000 cost. If a tardy cardiologist touches a patient, it's $7,000 immediately. This is caused by bone powder that's released from the hip. And from the knee, when they have the surgery, it activates platelets very fast. And platelets activated then will look for a plaque that's got uh, an ulcer in it, either a carotid or a coronary. And so, uh, and then these patients pre-surgery have an increased cardiovascular risk because of osteoarthritis, inflammation, sedentary lifestyle, metabolic syndrome, visceral fat, obstructive sleep apnea, LVH, and hypertension. All this gives them an increased risk. And it sort of sneaks up on them because they'll go from active to inactive over a period of time. And so, and then when they have the surgery, the activation of platelets with the hip and knee greatly increases their uh, risk of having a heart attack. And then it starts declining over a period of weeks. And then they wind up at the end with decreased risk of a cardiac event. And so we're interested in what is this cost that it says an awareness of factors associated with outlier costs will be requisite to being able to remain profitable if you're an orthopedic institute. So we've got total cardiac complications, cost, myocardial infarctions, LVH, hypertension, atrial fib, and we're kind of trying to see because it's not tracked in the bundling by the government. So we want to see, well, let's track our own and see what that looks like. And so that's what we've been doing. And we looked at our cost. If we do a few tests and uh, what do we have to do? And then we looked at some people that were some of our patients. And here's a guy who's low risk, even though he has all this heart stuff. And he's got quiescent heart disease, but he goes into atrial flutter. He gets anticoagulated. He bleeds into his hip. It dehisses. It gets infected. He gets DVT in the lower extremity, and it's $39,000. And if the bundling is for $19,000, then you're $21,000 over the usual cost, which is a big cost from just one little thing, atrial flutter. And so we feel that uh, basically, one, we can prevent it with anticoagulation. If we can prognosticate who's going to have that, or if it does occur, then we can just cardiovert them and don't have to put them on anticoagulation and we cardiovert them within the first uh, 48 hours. So we have a medication. We use ranolazine and dronedrone as a combination. It has 60% chance of preventing atrial fibrillation over a period of a year. So we ought to be able to do it for five days because that's all we need to do. And now here's our patient that we saw that uh, basically has atrial fib. He had a Carlson risk score from 1994 of two, which the orthopedists use frequently. Here's the Carlson risk, which is not modifiable. It's based on age, a couple of diseases. Here's our risk score, which we call a Tampa Bay raw risk score. And then we attenuate it with changes. And so we took our risk by taking out atrial fibrillation from 11 to 7. And then we said he does have coronary disease. And this is the coronary disease that we defined in this gentleman. This is a, a picture I showed you before, the coronary disease we'd find in this gentleman. And then he can't stent him because that's against the rules because he's asymptomatic. He doesn't have a main left. And so then we said, well, we'll just track him, which we did. And uh, here's his uh, CTA. And then here's when he came back in the cath lab when he's having chest pain within 24 hours. And you can see it's very fuzzy because he's filling in there with platelets. And so we put a stent in. But the other nice thing about it is that there's absolutely no damage to his heart or to his hip, which is a really nice thing. And here he is saying, I'm very happy that I had my hip surgery and also grateful that Dr. Harrison and Sharon prevented me from getting atrial fibrillation, but also knew I would get a heart attack, which they anticipated and prevented damage to my heart and my hip. The cost was $28,000, but if you had a surprise heart attack in the hospital that no one anticipated, the cost would be $40,000, $12,000 more. And then the cost would be even higher because they get in there too late. There'd be some damage. Worst place to have a heart attack is in the hospital. And so there'd be some damage and uh, the patient would be readmitted again with more cost accretion. And so here we see uh, the average cost was 18. And then our gentleman uh, who had the atrial flutter was 39,000. Our gentleman with the predicted heart attack was 28,000. 
And then a gentleman that we didn't have any part in who had an unpredicted heart attack is 40,000. And then readmission with congestive heart failure is 60,000. So there's a lot of cost that can be involved. We're talking 20,000 a case. And so we do all our prediction, all our work outside the bundle. You become bundled uh, 72 hours before admission and then 90 days after the surgery. So we do a workup for like $800 before they become bundled. And uh, this is what we do with the atrial fibrillation. And this is some information about upstream targets for atrial fibrillation and how to prevent it with chronic treatment. And then this is the cardiac risk and another 20%, uh, $20,000 potential. And we usually don't have to do heart flow on these people. And this is our protractal. These are fractals. Our protractor, this is a protractor and those are fractals. So protractal, uh, which basically shows that we want patients to be in this area. And uh, this gentleman was in this area and uh, we knew he's in trouble. And so first patient in the world, you're able to predict that he's going to have a cardiac event uh, when he has his hip done. And so we've enrolling more patients in this program. We only have 44 right now. This is the information that we collect right now. We're going to add troponin, BNP, and uh, this is our one of our treatment algorithms. And uh, the yellow is what we changed. The green shows stability of coronary disease. Uh, the reddish card of color, magenta, shows LVH. Purple shows hypertension. The red shows PAF or CAF, either paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or chronic atrial fibrillation. What's amazing is to go through here and see all this information that we've crowded into a one day of like testing that only took like an hour and a half, two hours, you know, when they come in and get evaluated. And yet we're able to make all of this information and actually make all these changes, severe uncontrolled hypertension, titrated blood pressure, Atrial fib chronic without rate control, turn off the ICD, hepatology clearance, uh, somebody uh, who uh, knew, newly discovered hypertension again, stopped coming in, the guy didn't need it, uh, prevented atrial fibrillation. So you look and see all the stuff, inhaled bronchodilator, skid out sedation, newly discovered hypertension, you know, false positive EKG for a heart attack, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, lateral wall ischemia, even after he got stented because he had a CTO, nobody saw. And so these are the things uh, that we're involved in and uh, very appreciated by the orthopedist that we're uh, going to expand the program. Of course, hypertension, total joint arthroplasty uh, has been written up. And these are some of my Polish colleagues. I'm a deputy editor of a Polish medical journal called Onc Review. And so I'm very active with those folks. And this is our current calculations on hard patients with $800. We spend a case, $80,000 prior to bundling. 12 patients with atrial fib that will be prevented. 12 patients with hypertension LVH that will get in a hypertensive crisis or have some problem or positive troponin event. Two or three with congestive heart failure readmission. So we calculate about $660,000 that we would save over 100 cases which is $6,600 a case on a $19,000, $18,000 payment. And so we're thinking the conservative assumption would be, say, $2,500 a case, which puts us up here, which is pretty good still on an, if you got an $18,000 uh, bundle. And so we're looking at the CT, and actually we didn't find a lot of coronary disease, which is surprising, but it's a bias. It's just a small group of cases, and so we'll expand the cases and see but the, the low CADRAS score is great because it discourages if a cardiologist does get called because of atrial fib or hypertension, which we hope we can just put this in place uh, with ARNPs and physician's assistants. But if they do get called for a cardiology consult, which is very expensive, we can decrease the expense because if they have no significant coronary disease, there's no reason to do a nuclear test or a cath. So, so we really cut down on that $7,000 uh, cost of a cardiologist touching a patient. That information was given to me by Fred uh, Cohen, who uh, runs a couple billion dollar investment for David Bondurant for TPG Biotech in San Francisco. And so the market knows exactly what's going on and making their market decisions. So right now our next steps are implement uh, cardiobiomarkers, the pre-op, which will be very interesting. We're setting that up right now and recruit the rest of 
the late adopters of Florida Orthopedic Institute. It's the largest private practice in the state of Florida for orthopedists. So we should be able to get some good numbers. And then begin, which we'll invite you to, our uh, cardio orthopedics case webinar February 1st at 9 a.m. And so that's, uh, that's cardio orthopedics, cardio oncology. And so the reason we went to this is uh, we found that uh, it took 17 years for 60% of doctors to uh, adopt giving an aspirin with a heart attack. And so 17 years, 60%. And so we said, why did it take that long? Well, the retirement rate is about 6% per year. So we had to wait for all those doctors to retire and get all new doctors in place before we would give an aspirin with a heart attack. And so it turns out that uh, we only got a 60% compliance even after we replaced all the doctors. So we thought about that and decided, well, we replaced the wrong doctors. We should have replaced the instructors. And so it turned out that the instructors have a retirement, disability, whatever rate, you know, about 3 to 4% per year. So you got to wait longer for them to retire. So that's why we got a 60% compliance rate. So we said, okay, how can we avoid all this? And we started with cardio-oncology, and we said, we just got to put in all the universities, therefore we replace all the instructors. So we took cardio-oncology, and in seven years, got in every university in the country, and many, many universities outside the country. And our last meeting in Vancouver, we had, uh, we run this program out of this office. The last meeting in Vancouver was we had 330 doctors from 30 countries. And so we said, hey, well, now we're experienced. We know how to do this. Uh, we've got a new revolution, and we've got something new that we need to change, and that's called cardio orthopedics. So we're going to do the same thing, and we know we'll be successful because we do the cardio oncology. We've got the same model, and so there we go. So we're starting with the conference, the international conference. We've got our Polish friends uh, on board, and we'll have others. And so we start, start exactly the same way we do the cardio oncology. So we're going to see a lot of coronary CT in use, and we're trying to find the least line of resistance. You know, we tried SOCOM, we, found, we tried police departments, fire departments, we tried many, many different avenues. Cardiologists don't want it, they won't change. And so agencies don't want it. The first thing you do when you go see a policeman, which they have high incidence of coronary disease, is the police chief will want the test, and then he won't want it for his people because it's too confusing for them, nobody wants to know if they have heart disease because they're afraid to know. People don't want to lose their jobs. Other people don't want the, the guys to go on disability. And so it's just such a mess for them. So only the police chief wants to know if he's going to die in office and how he's going to do. And that's about it. But we always get the top of whatever agency you go to. The top always, always comes in and wants a test. So there we go. That's where we are. I like the idea of cardiograph. I think there is a great opportunity. Uh, I think that if we can convert that into giving more information about asymptomatic patients and predict heart attacks like we're doing here on a daily basis, I think that would be extremely useful. And so uh, that's sort of what I am. Now we have talked to artificial intelligence uh, companies and of course we're partnering with Watson and it's really hard to get on their timetable to want to do 20,000 CT scans a day with artificial intelligence to pick out the uh, viable um, and the uh, vulnerable plaques and so uh, that's a very very difficult challenge for a company that seems to be very heavy on marketing but not uh, very heavy on science at this point. Comments? Uh, well, I certainly think uh, cardiograph is a great little system. It's got all the, uh, all the resolution and everything of the, of the bigger revolution CT system that gives you your whole heart in one shot. It's quick and easy to use and uh, you know, fits in a small space and uh, can be be great uh, system for you to have a few of it sounds like with your volumes. Yeah, yeah so, so, so so how can we how can we go how, excuse me how can we go about sort of partnering together to try to bet, develop better technology and wider spread use of this? 
I, that's what I'm interested in is putting this out front. Yeah, so we're more interested in like doing a partnership with GE to try to develop this as being a mainstream approach to cardiology. Yeah, I'm not sure that it's uh, either one of us on the phone that would be able to make that decision. Um, but can you can you uh, um, can you direct us to people that would be interested? And moving forward with a model like this, because we actually and actually moving into eventually artificial intelligence, because that's what we need to be able to do twenty thousand a day. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm not sure at this point who who that would be. Um, there's there's a number of people and a number of divisions within healthcare. I would have to think about uh, figuring out how to navigate who that would be to, to have you have a conversation with, because uh, I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, there are some folks that are a part of GE that are a part of our research wing, of which the two of us are not on the phone with you. Right. Um, so there's an opportunity to at least uh, have a discussion with those folks and see what their um, process would be, their desire would be, and the interest uh, after having a discussion. But if that, if we put you in touch with the research folks, then that would be who you would have a conversation with. From a commercial side, from my perspective, I can't be involved in any of those discussions. I understand. I understand. And from a commercial side, you know, we're going to push real hard for HCA to put a unit here a cardiograph unit here at Memorial, and we're going to push very hard for that. But we would want that to be kind of a model for GE for uh, to, to to basically bring our technology into action in the field. Okay. Yeah, and I'm not sure. You know, from that aspect, um, there are you know different levels of people and different levels of process that we would do from a, a CT perspective. But um, from a from a, an engineering standpoint or a technology standpoint, obviously the CT meets the requirements for what you're looking to do. John, I'm not sure. I mean, is there, did you see stuff there that might be beneficial for, um, you know, other things or discussions or... From an engineering standpoint, I guess, you know, uh, with a larger team, I, I, that I don't know. Yeah, I, I, in general, it, it's a great system, and the, you know, it's good to have to many things out there. It gives you the whole heart in one shot, to avoid a lot of, uh, I don't know how many issues you have with uh, scenes and stuff like that. So when you do a, a, a kind of a step and shoot procedure to, to acquire your uh, your data, so you, you avoid that whole uh, whole issue and have, in general, pretty clean images of bodies or portion of arrhythmias and stuff like that because you're just uh, just getting one shot. Yeah, we're getting uh, we're getting we're actually getting images from several revolutions that are being sent to us for us to do uh, cardiology post processing. So, which I know I know the technology very okay. well because I'm part of that. Yeah, I would I'm like to, maybe uh, you one could that regard, yeah. Yeah, maybe you could connect uh, me to somebody in Israel at the cardiograph company in Israel that I could speak to on these issues. Is that possible? Um, like all the marketing is coming through us. We've got, uh, you know, we got some engineers there. But, uh, yeah, it's not about marketing. Uh, uh, not U.S. I'm not interested in U.S. marketing. I'm an engineer. I've seen probably a uh, research system in a couple of sites now. And, uh, yeah, Some people have not been able to take a look at the machine, but now we've got a couple of clinical sites that are just starting to be up and running. Um, and we're talking about uh, you know those. They're talking to uh, the product manager today about the possibly start to have have physicians go and, and take a look at the systems uh, in 
insight and the pain and use. So any, any of those things are, are possible. Okay, well, I'd, I'd like to see what in use. That would be useful to me. So if you could set that up, that'd be fine. I'd love that. Well, I, I can I can help do that. Um, but we've got it. The only thing is, I think the, the one closest to us is um, in Louisiana, um, just north of, I think it's in actual New Orleans. But I, um, I think they, I don't think they've gone live yet. So... Obviously, we want to make sure that they have time to use the system uh, so that when you're there, they have a little bit of experience. Uh, but there may be some other ones that we might be able to look at, and I can find that out from my marketing folks in Milwaukee as well to see who's up and running and uh, how long they've been up and running and making sure they've had training. So when you go there, um, obviously, their staff knows how to operate it, and their physicians have seen some cases conversation. I will say that I don't know out of the systems that have been sold so far, because they're not in my territory. I don't believe any of them uh, involve cardiologists. I could be wrong, but I, I don't know. Uh, John, I don't know if you know that or not. Okay, well that sounds good. So, is there anybody you could introduce me to uh, in the Israeli group? good we got to get back to work here so i appreciate uh your call and uh jim and john it's great to, to talk to both of you thank you so much and anytime the weather uh gets too uh, oppressive to you up there john uh come on down to tampa and visit us we'd love to have you oh terrific well the only experience i had in milwaukee with I flew into Milwaukee and the temperature was like 10 below and I went to the hotel and sat on the radiator. <laughs> <laughs> I used to live there for eight years. But now you know why I live down here. I know why you live down here. Well, thank you so much, guys. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Too. Appreciate it. Great talk, with you. talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. We're casting pearls among swine. Swines, yes. Yeah, it's a waste of time. It's always a waste of time. They just want to sell stuff. Yeah. So let's go back and get our work done. You can hit the road. Yeah, I think I will. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, the uh, Abadiba Daba is what tipped me off when they started doing that. Yeah, they started with a potion, you know, I don't know about technology. I don't care about the